Thank you. Well, I'm very, very lucky for many reasons. One, we're at this wonderful conference. Thank you, Lunita and Yonut. And I'm very lucky that I'm following you and you did all the explanations that I needed. And I'm very lucky um, uh, for everything. Okay. So I hope maybe to give two seminars each, I hope full of pictures and qualitative. We'll see what happens. I may not. Okay, so I'm speaking basically about the same things as our, my esteemed uh, predecessor here. And you notice how I've avoided saying his name wrong. Uh. <laughs> okay, so um, this needs no introduction, except we have people here who may not know what it means. This is a time evolution equation involving a linear part, like a Laplacian, and a nonlinear part, like Navier-Stokes, like gross pitayevsky like, you know, whatever you want. Um, so every, many people, people often think that numerical work consists of time-stepping. Maybe not people here, but people often do. That is to say, following the same equations that nature does. But in fact, math teaches us other things that are useful, such as finding the steady states, uh, or traveling waves, and finding eigenvalues. And my philosophy, the one I've developed all this time, is how to take a time-stepping code and turn it into something which also finds steady states and uh, eigenvalues. Okay, so for this I start very small, at least for some people. Heat equation, d du dx equals dx squared u. Let's expand u in sine functions, periodic. Um, in space, and that means that each Fourier coefficient obeys the very simple equation dt uk equals minus k squared uk. Right. So obviously the solution to that, in one time step, you multiply by e to the minus k squared delta t. You multiply by an exponential. Here's the exponential as a function of k squared delta t. That's the exact answer. That is the goal. Now, uh, again, some of, the, some of you know this so well, and some maybe not. I'll go through anyway. Explicit Euler. Let's do UK T plus delta T is UK plus delta T times the deri time derivative, which was minus k squared UK. That gives us multiplication by 1 minus k squared delta T. That is this function as a function of k squared delta T. Oh, no. It doesn't look like the exponential. The exponential looked like that. It has the same value. It has the same slope at zero, but it doesn't do at all what it should, and it becomes big and negative, leading, as those who practice numerics know, to growing oscillations if time step is too big. So instead, we use implicit Euler, where we do t plus delta u at t plus delta t is u at t, and then delta t times the derivative, the time derivative minus k squared u at the future time. And the reason this is called implicit is because this is no longer a formula for, f for this is no longer ukt plus delta t equals all known things. This is unknown, hence it's an implicit method. You have to know, you have to solve this all together. And of course, in this case, it's very easy. We just bring this over to the left-hand side here. So we have 1 plus k squared delta t. Here we're going to, um, that means to get uk t plus delta t, we divide by 1 plus k squared delta t. And as I say, we're multiplying by a rational function of k squared delta t, which is here, which is a nice function. It does not uh, get big, it doesn't get negative, it looks a lot more like the exponential. Okay, so this is what people do, uh, and of course it gets more difficult when L is a large linear operator. This is a matrix inversion, and we don't like it. Um, so, now let's go to Navier-Stokes equations, where we'll forget all this stuff. We'll say we have a nonlinear operator, a linear operator, and to do time-stepping, dTU equals N of U plus LU. We're going to, uh, the usual thing to do that's taught in, in uh, where Mark and I went to school is explicit, implicit um, method, where we, the, the time derivative of N is taken at the current time, T, that's explicit, and the time derivative for L is taken at the future time, right? L, U, U plus delta T, uh, T, T, T plus delta T, yes? And so again, rearranging, we, 
we bring this over to the other side, and this is a time step here. U minus delta T L inverse, um, I, excuse me, I, I plus delta T N, and that is our time step. Okay, so I'm assuming everybody has a code to do this, that that's what you learned in your engineering class, your chemistry class, whatever it is, whatever domain you are practicing in. And what steady state solving, that's N of U plus LU, and of course we know we just learned about Newton's method, which has us take this operator A and solve the linear equation, um, A linearized about the current guess U equals A of U. This is not zero, or we would have solved the problem already. This, uh, so this gives us a linear equation to solve for little u, which we then subtract. And the linear stability analysis tells us uh, what we want is to have a steady state capital U and to find, line again, linearize A, this operator here, about capital U and um, uh, find the eigenvalues. And just as I'm going to try and form parallels between Newton and uh, between steady states and linear, so the, the general Algorithm, okay, what, again, those of you who are non-numericists, you know, you find eigenvalues by giving it to eig, you know, in MATLAB or something, but those of you who are numer know that if your matrix is 10,000 by 10,000, you probably shouldn't do that, so we, ha we use some iterative methods called Arnoldi or block power or different things where we're going to go for, uh, iterate, we're going to act with a matrix on, um, on, a, on a guess U to find a new guess U. Okay, so uh, that's the background here. And um, so all along here, uh, and this is something that we were saying before, we need to solve a linear system. Two ways to solve linear systems. Again, those who are not Dumeris' say, well, you give it to the routine called solve. But others know that you do an LU decomposition and a back solve. Um, do, uh, storing a matrix, let's say there's, it's an M by M matrix, takes a space M squared. Uh, solving, doing the LU decomposition, it takes a time M cubed. That's not very nice. The problem I worked on, I think, with Mark was a grid of 3D grid, 100 by 100 by 100. So that's M equals 10 to the 6th. So M cubed is 10 to the 18th. It's kind of big. Um, an alternative is conjugate gradient methods. Conjugate gradient methods, um, you uh, find the solution by acting with A. Now this may seem, again, to those who aren't used to them, this may seem very strange. We want to divide by A, not multiply by A. Acting with A, multiplying by A is going to give us a solution to A U equals right-hand side. How can that be? But that's what we do. You just take my word for it. And for an arbitrary matrix, each product requires, uh, each matrix vector product is, takes the time M squared. Matrix vector takes that. And you can see already how it works because each time you do AU, you're going to create a new direction. At the, in the worst case, you've created M directions, and surely you can represent your function as a, a sum of those M vectors. They're hope linearly independent, let's say. I mean, they're not, but let's pretend. So you'd have M actions, each taking M squared. That would be M cubed. Oh, it would be the same. This shows us there's no magic, no free lunch, etc. So there are two ways to save. One, perhaps each product does not take M squared operations, and this is the case. In, you know, these are not arbitrary matrices made out of data that you, that, that you were sent uh, on a, I was going to say a tape, a disk, the cloud. Where would one get data nowadays? Uh, you know, whatever. This is data that you got. If the matrix is this big, most likely it's a spatial discretization. So you're talking about things like taking derivatives, multiplying by potentials, so on. Surely it takes you something much closer to M operations to take a matrix vector multiplication. We're talking about taking a derivative, say, or multiplying by a potential. Okay, so that's way one that you would save. Another way that you would save would be if you didn't need all M directions. And that's the case if A is well-conditioned. So what's condi well-conditioned? A is well-conditioned if its eigenvalues lie close together. The best conditioned matrix is a multiple of the identity. You measure how badly conditioned you are by taking something like, again, real numerical analysts would never accept this, but I don't, fortunately, I don't speak in front of them 
and so I can say this. It's about the ratio of the maximum to the minimum eigenvalue. So the best condition number is one. If all the, uh, if you had a multiple of the identity, you would just have the same thing here and here. I mean, uh, yes, that's right, you would. Um, okay, so what if your matrix is not good? What are you going to do about that? Well, you could precondition, and this I always get in trouble with because I'm not going to precondition. It's going to turn out that there's automatic preconditioning. But let me say this anyway. You could precondition, that is to say, if you're trying to solve A u equals V and A is a bad matrix, well, that's the same as multiplying by P A u equals P V, and you would like for P A to be a good matrix. And the best way to understand what you want of P A is to look at the two extreme cases. Uh, P could be the identity, in which case it's easy to act with. That's nice, that's what you want, but it doesn't accomplish anything. Or PA could be well-conditioned. It could be the inverse. I mean, it could be the identity. P could be the inverse of A, right? So that's the other extreme case. But of course, you have to get it. Um, so you have these two, these two things. You want P to be easy to act with, and you want PA to be better conditioned. So you want it to be somewhere between... Absolutely, that's right. This is, hence, this little symbol here. <laughs> this, <laughs> right? It hides many sins. Yeah, right? Everybody agree? This means nothing, so it can mean anything. Huh. <laughs> okay, so the two extreme cases, um, and here's our case. And as it happens, the bad guy here is L. How do I know that the bad guy here is L? Well, the bad guy here is L. L is the Laplacian, so it's something like uh, uh, if you had uh, mx, my, mz, it would go something like minus 1 to minus mx squared min minus my squared plus minus mz squared. Again, in this hypothetical case where you have mx, my, mz equals 100, so this is uh, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, but there's three of them, so it's... So you can see L is bad. Now, what's the real proof that L is bad? Any answer? The real proof is sociological. Look what people are all doing. They're doing this. They're not taking the trouble to make the N implicit. They're making the L implicit. And they wouldn't do that if L wasn't the bad guy. If N was the bad guy, what point would there be in making L implicit? Right, sociological proof. People are doing it, hence it must, doesn't always work. Hence it, it's, um, anyway, L's the bad guy. Let's say L's the bad guy. And s we know how to invert, verse, invert L. <coughs> Why do we know how to invert L? Again, sociologically, every com scientific community has had to invert L. Every community, whether it's engineering or superfluid physicists or anybody, has a Laplacian and you make methods, and every community has different names, different methods, different this, different that. So everybody has some way of solving of, of uh, solving L inverse. And so again, I've been supposing that I had this operator because I come from some scientific community and I do this. However I do it, whether it's finite elements or spectral or finite difference or finite volume or any other methods? Sorry? Wavelets, yeah, anything. Okay, so all communities do something like this. So I have this, and so let me take u of t plus delta t minus u of t, where u of t plus delta t is gotten by doing this, taking a time step. This is all just algebra I'm doing here. Now, this, look at the parentheses. This guy goes with this guy. I want to take this guy out of the parentheses. All right, you see, I, I'm being very explicit here. I want to take the guy out of the parentheses, so I have to put him in the parentheses here. And so I have i minus i, and I take the delta t out, and look, u of t plus delta t minus u of t is like n plus l. Recall that n plus l is what I wanted the roots of. And I told you n plus l is bad. But if I multiply by 1 minus delta t l inverse, if delta t is small, I have this extreme case, I have this i, it's just the same as n plus l. 
so I haven't accomplished anything. But if delta t is large, this is like L inverse. So I have taken some of the badness out of n plus L. I've multiplied by L inverse, and that's my preconditioner. Now, two things. One, I, I, people always are getting this wrong. I haven't preconditioned. I just have this. I have this operator. It turns out that one can look at it as a preconditioner for n plus L. But you just have your time stepping operator, this, and it turns out that you have a preconditioner for the steady problem. It just turns out that way because you have your time stepping, which necessarily involves an implicit way of doing the L. That's the first thing to know. The second thing is people are always saying, delta t large? What do you mean? You mean like 0.2 instead of 0.1? No, like 100, like 1,000. Wait, you can't take delta t 100. You can't take delta t 1,000. Your code's going to be unstable. You're going to blow up. Look at these things. These are equal signs. They're not Taylor series. I am not using the fact that this times this is a low order Taylor series expansion for the exponential, which is what the usual use of this is. This is algebra. I multiplied, I divided. You can do this for any delta t. This applies to delta t equals 0.01, delta t equals 100. This is just equals. What is v here? Uh, v? v? B. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I defined it. OK, I'm sorry. I def it's this. It's the action. It's one time step. I defined way back for no, let's see. I just made these definitions here. My, my n plus l is a, and my time step in, stepper is b. Just OK. Um, so um, we can see that delta t interpolates between the easy but useless preconditioner and, uh, and the l inverse, which is useful. And I call this Stokes preconditioning because that's like the Stokes problem. Um, and so we take a Newton step, which would have been n plus l u, and then this is the linearization, and you're solving. I use an unconventional, I use a decrement for little u instead of an uh, increment. So uh, the black would have been a usual Newton step. But if, in my head, I multiply it by the red thing on both sides, then the rearrangement that we did on the previous page just tells us that's the difference between two time steps. This is u of t plus delta t minus u of t. Not a real u of t plus delta t, not like time stepping, but just take a, I mean, yes, like time stepping, but not like the differential equation. This is delta t large. Difference between two widely spaced consecutive linearized time steps. Difference between two widely spaced consecutive time steps. So this is the equation you have to solve. We solve it with the iterative methods that you've been told about, uh, which at the time I was using by CG stable. But as we were just discussing recently, I met with um, uh, Professor uh, Van de Gisden, who said, why are you using biconjugate gradient stable? I have proved that, uh, that IDR is better than biconjugate gradient. And nobody uses it. Look at all the citations of IDR. Look at these citations of IDR. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So I've proved it. What more can I do? So we all know how he feels, right? Everybody knows how he feels. Yeah, I showed it, and everybody cited me. So I promised him that every time I had an opportunity, I would mention it. Um, so IDR, and you see I've done it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, IDR is supposed to has BCJ stable as a special case, as the lowest performing case. IDR is apparently the way of the future. All these things, I have to say, I'm not a numerical analyst. I don't really know how they work. But all the, 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 the code for these methods is about this long. That's all. And all they do is take scalar products, add them, subtract them. All you do is you take products over and over of the matrix, and then in some order, you um, rearrange them. Uh, do, 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 do. R, I think, is reduction. D, dimensional. Uh, maybe. I'll, I'll look in just a moment. Uh, it's on my, I have this paper on my website, and if I, if I could read it without falling asleep, I will know more. Okay, so um, that's, that's the method. Now, again, I don't want to, to task people with too much difficulty. So mostly now I was going to show you pictures, and then I was going to go to eigenvalues and, and Bose-Einstein. So questions right now? Yes? Oh, 
no, no. Uh, uh, I guess I'll say so. Yes, uh, delta t doesn't. Ha uh, A delta C has to be, to be taken lar large enough to overwhelm the n, mostly, so that L inverse n is kind of overwhelmed. So most likely, if your L is that big, your n is kind of big too, and they kind of go in tandem. They both have derivatives. Maybe they both, I don't know. The little u is a decrement. Uh, this is, uh, what did you call it? Yeah, Newton step. This is your current guess, and then you're going to, yeah, that's your decrement. Later, I'm going to use it for eigenvectors. Okay, so now I just have some pictures, and this is an experimental picture of, conve of uh, convection, um, and all of these states were taken at a, um, the same Rayleigh number, and look at them. They're all very different, multiple solutions. Uh, I don't think that surprises too many people here, but still, look at that. They're, they've got uh, the white is hot fluid rising, the cold, uh, this is all a cell um, uh, of, of about this wide or so, like this, and cold, hot fluid rising, cold fluid falling. And so I had a program that integrated the equ in time the equations and uh, these are all the names that were given to these states. Look, this is Bjornhoff, um, who uh, called the state Mercedes. Very cute. So, of course, we had to do, as well as him, we call this pizza, you know, and this and that. Okay, so we found this. We went up, we went down, this and that. This is not a bifurcation diagram because it's just gotten from time stepping, and it doesn't explain how you got from here to here. There's just a bunch of arrows. We got this state, then we went to this uh, Rayleigh number, and then we went to, the, and then this one and this one, and this is what we saw, and then we were here, and then we went to this Rayleigh number, and we got that. So it's just a bunch of experiments, but this kind of illustrates my point of how you should have a time-stepping code and be using them both. And this, how many, how many variables are there here? There are 384,000 variables because my grid is 4 in radius, 120 azimuthal, 20 in height, and there are four fields. And I was there. Are, this is the complete bifurcation diagram that I found. There are 17 branches here, and I was so proud until today. What did you tell me? 65? 65, yeah. Usually when I say 17, people say, oh, wow! But uh, <laughs> I don't think I'd do better now. It's not a question, you know. No, it's a question. It's mostly a question of patience. You know, what you do is you get all these initial conditions here, and then you go, and then you you follow from them. Um, so they're shown symbolically here. You can see this is a, a well. I just showed them symbolically. This is a Mercedes, and the, you know, now this thing, of course, has no intrinsic interest except if somehow you have some industrial process that has. Although it's a nice illustration that you know people sometimes think. Oh, Multiple solutions, you know, there's a big fashion now that turbulence is caused by the fact that you have multiple solutions or something like that. But Boussinesque and Navier-Stokes and presumably gross pitayevsky and everything all have multiple solutions. And not just multiple like two or three, but multiple like 15, 20, 100, you know, and who knows how many more. <laughs> These are all steady because they were found by steady state solver. We also found some periodic ones. And sort of to make sense of all this, we divided them by symmetry, symmetry class. So if you look, it's necessarily the case that if you bifurcate from an axisymmetric state, which the conductive state is, your solutions, your eigenvectors must be trigonometric. That's a theorem. It's the same one that says that, you know, if you have a constant coefficient linear differential equation to solve, then your solutions are exponentials, right? You know, you plug in e to the lambda t, and you get a polynomial in lambda, okay. So anyway, that's necessarily, they look like this. And now we can follow these different families of branches. And so this paper goes, goes um, on. So this is the most pretty one. This is the m equal 3. So you have bifurcation to m equal 3. This is the Mercedes. And you can look at, as this is the, I think, the cutest one. Um, thin lines mean that the solution is unstable. This one is unstable, necessarily unstable, because it wasn't the first to bifurcate. This is the one, to, this is the stable one. All succeeding ones are unstable at onset. So this one is unstable. And um, 
So look, you have a, this is called a circle pitchfork because it could have any phase. Then it makes an ordinary pitchfork where it's going, uh, it goes to this, and this is an ordinary pitchfork because over here, there was no difference between yellow and purple, right? Everybody understand that? I'm trying to make this understandable by everybody. I was, I promised to do that. Um, so yellow and purple f have the same role. Here you can see they don't. Here the yellow is the propellers. They're different from the purple. There exists, because of the symmetry of the problem, there exists another branch where you have purple pro propellers and yellow. Okay, so this has broken the symmetry between yellow and blue, otherwise known as the Boussinesque symmetry. So this is an ordinary pitchfork. This is a circle pitchfork. Then it does a saddle node. Ah, b we were trying to keep up with the Mercedes and look, Mitsubishi, right? I have a Mitsubishi, so it's a good name. And it has a, makes a saddle node and goes to a pattern. Couldn't find a um, card name for this. We looked. Uh, it's kind of like Toyota, but Toyota doesn't have threefold symmetry, and that's so important. So we called it clover leaf, and this one gets called marigold. But I like this problem because, I mean, for many reasons, but one of them is because normally when a uh, flow undergoes a saddle node bifurcation, before and after looks the same. Who cares? But here you can really see the difference. Here it had this, this um, triangle thing, and here it has these three guys. It went from concave to convex, and I've never seen that, where a saddle node bifurcation really makes itself felt that way. Anyway, so it does this, it has another saddle node bifurcation, and finally here it becomes stable and does the Mercedes. So if you're doing experiments and you see this Mercedes, never would you have imagined that this was the tortuous role, route to creating it from the, uh, the conductive state. Only by finding all these unstable states would you ever have imagined it. Yes? We started with this, and then we, went, we did this and this and this and this and this. But we, we always started with stable things because we started with time integration, which necessarily finds only stable things, and then we went, uh, we went around. So we started here and then went down and went to there. Again, the benefit of having a parallel time integration and Newton code that you can just run around between the two. And we could find eigenvalues. And oh, since I have such interest here, let me go to something, some other things I didn't mention. No, I won't. I won't. I won't. I'll just go back to, to what I was doing. Um, OK, this is eigenvalue being followed around. Um, oh. Doesn't matter. I, I, I want to go quickly because I want to get to my other. Oh, so I, uh, this is snaking. How many people have heard of snaking? Yeah. So this is um, Edgar Knobloch. Um, he says he didn't discover it was Alan Champneys who discovered it, but then the first fluid dynamical uh, 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 discoveries of snaking were uh, done by this method by the group of Mercader and the group of Bergeon. So this is a whole bunch of saddle nodes. Do, 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 So you really have, you have, you really have to know unstable, you know, necessarily they do that. And this, each time they add another role as they're doing this. <laughs> Not me, um, Baptiste Noblock, Alonso Mercader. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 probably, I, I think so. <laughs> you, can <laughs> you can ask them. Um, and then there's 3D snaking. Yeah, 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 for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is 3D snaking, where each time they add another pedal thing. And this is the group, group of Bergeon that used this method. OK, now we go on to linear stability analysis, which I'm trying to present in parallel with this. Again, though you could, it's not quite parallel because already Newton is a. Um, Anyway, you could do, you could call eigenvalue finder of your huge matrix sized uh, 10 to the 6. We said this wouldn't be possible. Again, matrix requires m squared, a 3D case, uh, I would take m cubed. So again, the parallels, which are not perfect, but suppo supposing you, again, we're going to say that we're going to do this by acting with the matrix, which takes a time less than m squared because this is not some arbitrary matrix whose data came from the cloud. Um, um, so, uh, but, and in addition, now, how else are we going to save? Well, we don't want all the eigenvalues, although it's, sometimes it's nice. Uh, we just want a few. 
Um, so we're going to, okay, so there, the analog of preconditioning is how to aim the methods at the desired eigenvalues. How to aim it. Um, okay, so let me go back to this, uh, what the, what's this whole family of Arnoldi, just as in the conjugate gradient. All you know how to do is act with the matrix. So we act, 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 act. And if we're doing power method, how many people know power method? Everybody took numerical analysis? Once? Well, power method, you just keep acting. Naturally, you go to the eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue. And so that's what you do. The Arnoldi method is a generalization of that. You have a bunch of, eigen ve of, of, of vectors, and you keep orthogonalizing them to one another, and you make the matrix that is the representation of A on those vectors, and you diagonalize it, and those eigenvalues are guesses of the, um, to the uh, ones you want. Okay, but the problem is, look what I said, this would find you the largest eigenvalue. We don't want the largest eigenvalue. Remember what we said about L plus N. L was the bad guy because it had such large eigenvalues, large negative ones. So we don't like it. Uh, let's look at some matrix transform. Okay, first let's take this very easy theorem. If, um, uh, if you have eigenvalue, uh, if u is an eigenvector and lambda an eigenvalue of a matrix A, then f of A, the function of A, gives you the eigenvectors and the function on the eigenvalues. Isn't that amazing? And that works for, you'd be surprised at how many people don't seem to know that. And that works for all f. And so here are some of the f things you can do. Uh, first of all, here's my situation where I am having a bunch of eigenvalues that are crossing the axis. I draw my things differently from you. I draw them 90 degrees. So his, if you were looking for him, it would be like that. Okay, but I'm, these are the ones I want. If I do, so this is good, but look, these are my bad L ones. Remember, L is bad guy, bad L ones. Um, if I do the exponential on this, well, the exponential of the axis is the unit circle here, and then I have my, this guy here, he is going up here, and these two are here. So that's pretty good. It's getting me the ones I want, but the other ones are pretty close by. That's not good. I'd like them to not be close by. But look, if I took the inverse, then I would be in good shape because all these guys who are big would become small, and then these guys, which are small, would become big. So that would be good. And who, can, who, know, who, who right away sees a problem with that? Good, nobody yet. Okay, you can be thinking about it. Uh, that's not a problem. No, nobody yet. Okay, um, so you could exponentiate, and that is in fact what most people do. All to, in order to turn a time step encoder into one that finds you eigenvalues, all you have to do is linearize the operator and just go over and over and over, and that will get you towards the eigenvector that you're interested in, because that's the same thing that, um, that real life is doing. The trouble is that now we're talking about approximating the exponential delta t must be small, so this is like the identity, so each time we act, we're not accomplishing much. Um, so it's slow. If, in contrast, we take the inverse, and I'm not going to go through the algebra, but it's the same kind of thing where we're going to take the inverse because we already have these um, time-stepping code. Should I go through it or not? It's, it's analogous. I'm I want to take the inverse of A, and I can do it because... Um, th here, here, I want to take the inverse. And so that's my un plus 1. So let me multiply on both sides, just in my mind. I'm not doing this in the code, by this. And I recognize this. This is what I saw before. And that is just an implicit, explicit time stepping and the difference between them. But why isn't this Newton's method then? This should give me the, same, the steady states, not the eigenvalues. Because on the right-hand side, you have something different. You take a Stokes time step. You're not taking the difference between, okay. So those who want to go, again, you can solve this with biconjugate gradient stable. I didn't know about IDR at the time. And this time, uh, you can get as close as you want. Especially, you want the eigenvalues. Bartas, you want the eigenvalues that are close to zero. And um, uh, you want the eigenvalues that are, you want the eigenvalues that are close. 
well, uh, you'll tell them one after. <laughs> You want the eigenvalues that are close to zero. And the closer they are to zero, the better off you are. Because look, your enhancement, the more you're getting rid of the bad stuff at a rate one over zero. So that's good if you have an eigenvalue that's, cl that's close to zero. The closer your eigenvalue is to zero, the better you are. Basically, if your eigenvalue is, is, is you know, however small, you can do it in one step. Unlike the other one, which took thousands of steps. OK, so, um, so that's what I recommend. Now let us go to the Bose-Einstein problem. And here I am fortunate to have my dear associate here who will answer all questions about Bose-Einstein condensation because what I always tell people when I teach numerical analysis, I say, oh, you, if you learn numerical analysis, you can publish papers in fields you know nothing about. So here, here OK, everybody knows this. Everybody knows this. Uh, gross pitez, da, 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 da. OK. L plus N, as before. Though this isn't quite, it's not important that the potential, that these things are not N. It, the important thing is that L be linear. The N doesn't have to be nonlinear. It just has to be that L can be inverted. So you've got that, Bartosz, that the uh, uh, eigenvalue near zero is a good thing? Yeah, OK, good. So V now, in this case, is a cylindrical trap. See, look. I use the words, right, cylindrical trap, right? Nobody knows I didn't know what that meant, <laughs> right? And again, this is the, the, the big thing, 10 to the sixth. And um, we're looking for the eigenvalues. And um, OK, these are the papers that uh, we published on this case here. And these are the, what the wave functions look like, more or less. OK, so you recall that we talked about, OK, I was talking about those um, functions, the matrix transformations, because remember I said that just as with Newton, we were going to precondition so as to do better. Here we're going to take a, f uh, a mapping so as to do better. And here I was talking about the kind of mapping that I do because I do dissipative systems, not Hamiltonian systems. So my eigenvalues are all, the bad guys are all negative and real and they're over there. And these are the nice things to do then. And you still haven't figured out what's the problem. Well, you'll eventually figure it out. Um, but these are Hamiltonian systems where generally the eigenvalues in a kind of rest state or something are all on the imaginary axis. And what we're looking for is for them to get together and jump out, right? Either at the, at the origin or elsewhere. So we could exponentiate as over there. We're looking for this pair that's going to go to this origin and jump out. We could do that. But again, that wouldn't, these guys are still hanging around. It would be a lot better to um, invert them, and even better, but even there, they're kind of messy. It would be better to take the square. If you're looking for eigenvalues that are going to cross zero, because look, they're all going to be real, and they're going to be bigger necessarily than these. Um, so here's what we did. Uh, uh, here I, I took the radical step of calling my um, unknowns psi instead of u to show I, this is Bose-Einstein. And um, so the linear stability of steady state is determined by linearizing the psi cubed around, uh, this is capital psi, this is a small psi. So this is the uh, increment or the eigenvector. And the, linear, the linearized um, uh, NLS looks like this, and it's skew symmetric because of the i. If you have a psi r, multiplying by i turns it into a psi i. If you have a psi i, multiplying by i turns it into a real. So we don't like this. We don't like uh, matrices like this. So we will square it, and we get this nice block matrix, block diagonal matrix, which, in fact, has the same eigenvectors, both this one and this one. You can show that. And so this is the inverse square, uh, square method, and this is how we did it. Uh, that is to say, we did a shift, and we used L inverse squared, contrary to what I usually do, because in this case, this was a pseudo-spectral code. Everything was easy. You had the L just by itself. And you solve this equation here over and over, um, uh, hardly any time at all, maybe three five or five times. You solve it with biconjugate gradient stable. This is a nice matrix because A squared is kind of, this is A squared, and it's kind of like L squared. 
It's got two, ba two other guys, but it's really like L squared, both of them there. So it's a nice matrix. And so um, with this, yeah, hold on, we'll go here. Yes, these are the results. This is the pancake and the cigar. And this is N, the number of particles. And this is a saddle node bifurcation where you have appearance of two branches to the left and disappearance to the right. The red is obtained from a, an approximation where, where you, it's a spherically symmetric. No, it uses Gaussian functions, Gaussian approximation. It's the red. So it shows that the Gaussian approximation is no good. This is much better. And um, this saddle node, oh, this is for the cigar, this is for the pancake, and um, we can see what's happening in these bifurcation diagrams. A Hamiltonian saddle node bifurcation is, okay, the steady states in Hamiltonian systems are saddles and centers, and here you have a saddle across and a center, a circle, and they're going to meet, they're approaching, and they're meeting, and they're killing each other. They're annihilating each other. This is a Hamiltonian saddle node bifurcation, which is when uh, potential gets rid of its other two, uh, gets rid of its um, uh, minima there. So that's what's happening here. And so that is the end of what I have to say about this topic. Okay. <laughs> Oh, well, L is, uh, how should I say, I mean, people are using it already in their time-stepping codes, the fact that they have already made, made their operator L, and they're, that's right, they're, they're using it all the time, that L is fixed. No? Well, in a sense, you do. You're, you're not doing that. Uh, in a sense, that's the case. We'll just say that whatever you need to do to, to solve L, Okay, when I write L inverse, that always means solving the equation L x equals y. And whatever you've done to make that cheap has been done. You never calculate L inverse, as we were saying. But whatever you need to solve L x equals y has been done. It's not making L inverse, but it's doing something, and it's finished. And now you can consider that solving L x equals y is a cheap thing. No, but you have to. Your x is, no, your y is changing, but your y is changing. L, you're solving lx equals y for different y's and getting different x's. You can't do anything about that. It's a different y. Right, but you can invert l from the no, 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 no. No, 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 no. If there's one thing you should get at this, no. You have done the equivalent of that. It's not inverting. No, if you do an L U decomposition, say of L, which is not something I recommend either, but if that, that, that's the same. You've treated it, you've done everything. It's not because you have L inverse that you can solve L X equals Y faster than other conventional methods. You're not trying to save yourself from doing L inverse, believe me. You're trying to, we can talk about it later, but no, you are, you are being as economical as you can, as, I mean, all engineers, everybody is doing this in the whole world. That's how they're start signing airplanes, that's how they're doing chemical reactions, everything. They, they've treated L and they've, they're done with it. L is fine. You're solving LX equals Y with different Ys. Different Ys. Each time, different Ys. Imagine that you had L inverse, it's the equivalent. No, 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 no. In that case, you don't. <laughs> you don't understand. You don't. Well, we'll talk about it later. It's not, it's not that you're trying to save yourself from doing L inverse, honestly. You've done something that's the equivalent of making L inverse. How, how? Thank you. Yes.
Yes, well, as you see, we fixed our n, or rather we fixed mu. No. Yes, it is different, and my esteemed colleague will explain what we did to make this possible. <laughs> no. <laughs> but if but there's a but there's a relationship between n and mu. Uh, my esteemed colleague knows much more than I do about this matter. Yes. What is the name of the person I kept saying no, no to? No, 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 the other one, the one just before, but in front of, uh, in front of, uh, I wouldn't say no to him. Who was I saying no to? What's his name? In front of Panos, Ricardo, okay. Okay. Okay, but let me say to Ricardo, imagine that we did, we got L inverse. That's what we did. Just that's the same. We have L inverse. We're just going to say that. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So the other thing I'm really going to try and be extremely pictorial about this, and this comes. I was inspired by Anna's talk here. To okay. So this is talking about a completely different subject. This is hydrodynamic only. This is transition to turbulence. And it's not like Berenger. It's low uh, Reynolds numbers. Uh, although it was discovered at Berenger's own labs by Berenger's own colleagues. Um, OK, so you may be wondering what this is. Let me tell you what it is. Plain couette flow. Remember, Anna told you about pipe flow. Pipe flow, you, you have a pipe, you go <laughs> right? That's one way of moving it. Another thing is plain channel flow. You have two two uh, plates and you go <laughs> this is not what's happening here this is plain couette flow and we're moving one plate this way and the other one we're moving that way okay that's all it is and there's water in between it's not cold it's not hot it's nothing it's just water or oil or something what is it Berenger? what they use in their plain couette flow experiments yes water okay there Okay, so as I just said, these are the three, except these are, now this is, this is the hardest thing in 3D flows. This is turned this way, so you have the, the, pipe, the plates this way, and the pipe is, is this way, except it's not. It's this way, right, and the plane's this way. Okay, everybody understand? Now, although you all know about superfluids and zero Kelvin and who knows what else, people don't know what makes water go turbulent. They don't know why the pipe, uh, you know, when you turn the robinet, the faucet, uh, the water goes blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry? Why it goes turbulent, not why it goes. Okay. So nobody knows. It doesn't go linearly. 
Okay, so nobody knows why water doesn't goes turbulent. Isn't that strange in these flows? Okay, so these are these experiments in early 2003. This is a uh, plain coet flow, and look how clever this was. This was invented in Sweden. Instead of having these two... No, I know. No, no. I know, I know, but I'm talking... This thing is from 2000, 2003. Of course, the experiment was, I, it was before. It was Sabine Boutin and all that. And before, it was, what's his name? Um, um, Hegseth. And anyway, okay, but I'm talking about this. Th this picture comes from 2000, 2003. Okay, so there's a clever thing where instead of having to move your plates, you have a film here, so the plate can, can stay like this, and the film moves, and it's like moving the plates, right? So that made it possible to do uh, plain coet experiments. Um, this was first found in Taylor coet flow uh, back in the 60s, and here it is in a very, very large Taylor coet flow. Okay, so the amazing thing is that this is turbulent, and this is laminar here. This is turbulent, and this is laminar. And this was already commented on. Amazing, turbulent and laminar, and they coexist. How strange, uh, commented in 60s. But it was not known how strange it was. The aspect ratio here was like this. And these are experiments with an aspect ratio like this. Huge cylinders, very tall, and very close to the same radius, OK? So you can fit many, if you look here, the ratio of the circumference to the gap is not so much. It's what, six, eight? Here, the ratio of the circumference to the gap, which is drawn to scale, is enormous. And what they, what Prichard and Dosho found was that this little, this coexisting thing was just one member of a regularly appearing pattern of, um, uh, laminar, turbulent, laminar, turbulent, laminar, turbulent, laminar, turbulent. Okay, this length here between a laminar and uh, between two laminar places here is the same size as the gap. Excuse me, no, it's 20 times the gap. So it's very large. This, this distance, these cylinders are very close together. And similarly, and I'm just going to show you movies, I think, after this. Okay, similarly, this. Okay, you see these pictures. This is these same, uh, these same uh, bands, and you see these things that go this way? This is the distance between the two plates. So you see that this distance here is about 20 times this distance here. So you need to have a very large experiment to see it. Okay, is this clear? Now I'm going to show you a movie of, oh, no, first, yeah, I'm going to show you a movie um, here. This is, no, I don't want it to start. Whoop. In this, this movie is plain coet flow. No, come on. Oh, did I do something bad? No. Um, this movie is plain coet flow. You see these same blue-red things that you saw before that are approximately this, this distance here. Now, what is it, what's being shown here? This is the streamwise velocity. Now, one plate is moving to the right, and that's red fluid. And one, one plate, the plate behind is moving to the left, and that's blue fluid. Okay? And if it were laminar, then this would be red, and this would be a little less red, a little less red. And in the middle, it would be green. And then it would be uh, blue always over here. But in the middle, it would be green and stationary. But this is turbulent. And, and this is the one thing that people do understand in wall-bounded shear turbulence, is that just like with convection where heat rises and you have this, you have bubbling up of coal of the blue and the red. This, the red has been brought from the front. The blue has been brought from the back. And that's what you see here. OK? Everybody see this? This is at Reynolds number 500. Think what a small Reynolds number that is. And that's not a Reynolds number lambda. OK, so here it is. So there's little kind of snakes. And now we're going to lower the Reynolds number to 350. And you're going to see spontaneously these green regions. And even the people in the back there can appreciate this movie because it's just a movie. 
and <laughs> and you see the green place here, and you see how these have spontaneously gotten into a band like this. Spontaneously, it's done this angle, and it's done this green spot. And this is still, there's a plate that's going this way and another one that's going that way. Nobody told it, told it this angle or this wavelength. Okay, and this distance is still approximately the distance between the plates. And it did this spontaneously. It wanted to do that. Okay, and it'll just go do that forever. Okay. Um, so we investigated this a lot. And of course, you're going to want to know what determines the angle, what determines the wavelength. And the answer is, we still don't know. We know a lot about this flow, but we don't know. If somebody can explain it simply, they're going to be famous. Okay, so we did a bunch of things, which I'm not going to show you. We found the upper, uh, right. oh, you might wonder, can, it, can the, you, you can, by numerically, you can force it to have different angles. You can have it do, do different wavelengths. You can do a bunch of things. You can make them uh, do different ones like this. Okay, but now I'm going to show you something else, because uh, I said I want to keep it. Just sort of. I want to show you, okay, two things. One. This is no longer plain quet flow. This is called Wallef flow. It, they're, they're, it's fr free slip boundaries. And uh, free slip boundaries. And so if it's free slip boundaries, if it's not viscous pulling, then how are you going to move it? Well, you make a body force that's sinusoidal like that. And lo and behold, I'm not going to tell you, it forms bands too at the same Reynolds numbers. So you don't need the walls. This is Wall-bounded shear, wall-bounded shear flow turbulence, and it doesn't need walls. Yes, Berger. Yes, exactly. Also called. Yes, but that's not what this is. No, this is not the right geometry for it. Um, so you can see it does the same thing. Isn't that amazing? It doesn't need the walls. Um, and it's struck. Okay, I'm not going to go through this. I'm not going to go through this. Here, I can show you the formation of the bands. Oh, I think these movies don't play. I think I remember. No, no, they do play. Um, this is bands. Well, it doesn't matter. Okay, now I'm going to just sh gonna show you one last thing. Um, they appear at Reynolds number of four. Uh, if you're going, generally, the way you do this, exp both experimentally and numerically, you make turbulence and you lower the Reynolds number. We saw that. Okay, the highest one is around 430. Four, that's about the, th the threshold. Now, what's the lower threshold, and what kind of threshold is it? Is it continuous or is it discontinuous, for example? This is the turbulent fraction. And so we did this huge simulations of well flow, and this was the great thing about well flow, since it doesn't have boundary layers, you do not have to resolve the place near the boundaries. You can actually use many fewer points. So this is a huge, huge domain, and the experiments done at Saclay by Prigent and Dauchot are like this blue thing. The um, Boutin, that was this size, also Saclay. Um, you weren't referring to Boutin, were you? No, who were you referring to? Anyway, these, these things were this size and this size. The, uh, the simulations of Duguay were like this. The um, PhD thesis of Avila was like this. And then, um, then there were these little things. Anyway, this is our domain. It's enormous. Um, and you can see why it needs to be enormous, because this is Reynolds number above critical one. Supposing you're near the critical one. Well, you could easily mistake, you know, you're going to think there's no turbulence when there is. Right? This is not a, tra this is a transition. I mean, maybe you're used to this. Um, this is not a transition where you start off uh, weak and then you go strong. This is a transition where you start off sparse and then you fill it up. This turbulence here is every bit as strong as the other turbulence when it's high Reynolds number and uh, it's just not occupying much of the space. It goes from, so you can see why it's important to have a large domain. In addition, look what these things are doing. Don't they look like bands? Remember, they don't look like the bands we had before because this is huge. This is enormous. This is much bigger than the domains I was showing you before. But these are the, have the right angle, and they're about the right spacing. They're now disordered. But these are bands. This is as you're lowering to get rid of the turbulence, and you stay banded. 
You don't go into sand or pixels or something. These are not scattered pixels. These are scattered, it's like toothpicks. The last thing you see before you die is toothpicks. Not sand. <laughs> so that's... And those are the bands. Those are the bands. Just so. You might think that the, um, that the elements would be these things. But they're not. They're these bands that are, look enormous on a normal scale. But they are, um, when you make a huge... Um, w this thing here is 2650 by 2650 by 2. And when you do that... Okay, they found, Botin, Chate, and Duguay found experimentally and numerically that the, uh, the critical Reynolds number was 323, 324. They found the same critical Reynolds number, and they found it was discontinuous. So you would think they would have the answer. Numerics agrees with experiments, same critical Reynolds number. But no, we find that it is continuous. Now, note, with a transition like this, you cannot find it to be continuous because we would have to go, remember I said, you, it happens with bands. You need to have room for one toothpick. The last toothpick needs room. And it is some finite percentage of your finite box. So this last point that we got here, that's the last one we can get. We can't go to zero, except if we take a larger box. But eh, I think it's continuous. What's more, this thing is not a square root dependence, it's a 0.58 dependence, and the 0.58 this is turbulent fraction, so it's the amount of the area that, oh, the amount of the area that's filled with stuff, the fraction, and it's 0.58, which is what is predicted for the directed percolation universal transition uh, scenario. And, you know, this is now done, so 0.58, and I'm going to end with a movie. Here's the movie. This is, again, a run of well F flow, and this is the disappearance of the... And you see that it's retaining its little sticks. As it dies, it sticks. It's not sand, it sticks. Isn't that amazing? And that's the end. <laughs> mm.